In this section, I'm going to be introducing the formal definition of the continuous time Fourier transform, as well as commenting on how the Fourier transform was developed. As we've already seen, Fourier series are an extremely useful representation technique for periodic functions. Unfortunately, however, in practice we often encounter functions that are aperiodic. So how can we handle the aperiodic case? Now we've made a considerable effort in developing the ideas behind Fourier series, so rather than simply throw away all of this work, it would be nice if we could somehow leverage this work by building on Fourier series. So let's think about this more carefully. Fourier series only deal with functions that are periodic, and we want a means to handle functions that are aperiodic. So in order to develop a new representation technique for aperiodic functions that builds on Fourier series, we would need to establish a link between periodic and aperiodic functions. So in this regard, consider the following thought experiment. Suppose that we have a t-periodic function where we let the period t approach infinity. What would it mean for a periodic function to have an infinite period? Well, it would mean that the function repeats its value every infinity units, but since infinity is never reached, this would effectively mean that the function never repeats. In other words, an aperiodic function can be viewed as a limiting case of a periodic function where the period approaches infinity. Therefore, we can use Fourier series to build a representation technique for aperiodic functions by taking the limiting case of Fourier series as the period associated with the Fourier series goes to infinity. To begin, recall that the Fourier series representation of a t-periodic function x is given by this particular equation here. So this equation is essentially just the Fourier series synthesis equation and Fourier series analysis equation combined together and written as a single equation. So for the reasons explained earlier, we can obtain a representation for aperiodic functions by taking the limiting case of a Fourier series as the period capital T associated with the Fourier series approaches infinity. So what we want to do here is we want to take the limit of this particular equation as capital T goes to infinity. So if we take this limit, what we end up with is this particular equation here. And I won't go through the full details of the computation of the limit. I'll just sort of summarize what's happening when we take the limit. So as capital T goes to infinity, what happens is the, the outer summation, the summation here, becomes an integral. So this is why we have an integral appearing here in the new equation that we end up with. The quantity 1 over capital T becomes equal to 1 over 2 pi d omega, where d omega is an infinitesimal. And then k over, uh, k2 pi over capital T becomes a continuous variable omega. So when all is said and done, what we end up with in the limit is this particular equation here. And this representation for the aperiodic function x is known as the Fourier transform representation. Now we can take this equation and we can split it into two smaller equations. We can take the portion of the equation that's labeled as x of omega and write this as a separate equation. So we can write an equation x of omega equals and then it's equal to this inner integral, the integral inside the large pair of parentheses. And then what we can do for the second equation is we can get rid of these parentheses, everything inside the parentheses here, and just replace this by x of omega. And that gives us a second equation. And it turns out that in the equation x omega equals this inner integral, the one inside the large parentheses, the quantity big X is called the Fourier transform of the function little x. So essentially this inner integral here defines the Fourier transform of the function little x. The classical Fourier transform for aperiodic functions, as was introduced on the previous slide, doesn't exist for many functions of practical interest. So what I mean by this is there's many functions x which are of practical interest for which this integral here will fail to converge. And some examples of functions for which this integral will fail to converge would be functions where x is either a non-zero constant function or a periodic function such as a real or complex sinusoid, the unit step function, the signum function, and this list goes on and on. Now fortunately the Fourier transform can be extended to handle functions like the ones that are listed above and this results in what's known as the generalized Fourier transform. Essentially the generalized Fourier transform extends the classical Fourier transform so as to allow functions and their Fourier transforms to have formulas that include generalized functions such as the delta function. By allowing generalized functions to appear in the Fourier transform calculations we can handle a greater variety of functions with the Fourier transform 
including non-zero constant functions, periodic functions, and so on. Although technically speaking the classical and generalized Fourier transforms are not the same thing, we can think of them as being the same for the purposes of this course, since their differences only become apparent when the underlying math is studied in much greater depth than what we consider here. For this reason and what follows, I'll typically not make any distinction between the classical and generalized Fourier transforms, and I'll simply refer to both transforms as the Fourier transform. So at this point I'd like to formally introduce the Fourier transform. So the continuous time Fourier transform of the function little x, which is denoted by f little x, or capital X, is given by this particular equation here. This equation is sometimes referred to as the Fourier transform analysis equation. Sometimes it's called the forward Fourier transform equation. And then the inverse of this transformation, in other words the inverse Fourier transform of capital X, which is denoted by F inverse of capital X, or just lowercase letter X, is given by this particular equation here. This equation is sometimes referred to as the Fourier transform synthesis equation. Sometimes it's called the inverse Fourier transform equation. And as a matter of notation, sometimes we want a way to denote that a function little x has the Fourier transform big X. So we can denote this compactly in terms of the following notation here. Uh, where we have this double arrow sort of notation. The thing on the left of the double arrow is the original function little x. The thing on the right side of the double arrow is the Fourier transform of the thing on the left hand side of the double arrow. And as a matter of terminology, the function little x and big x constitute what is called a Fourier transform pair. At this point I'd like to consider a couple of examples in which we compute Fourier transforms of functions and in particular I'd like to begin with example 6.1. In this example we're asked to find the Fourier transform of the function little x where little x is given by this formula here and we're told that a and t naught are real constants so effectively what we have is a delta function that's been translated or time shifted by t naught and also scaled by a factor of capital A. Also in this example we're asked to write the Fourier transform representation of x. So first of all let's find the Fourier transform of little x so to do this we have to recall the definition of the Fourier transform which is included in this annotation here so this is the definition of the Fourier transform so we're just going to substitute in for the function little x, the function that we're given in this particular problem, which is this function here. So that gives us this line. And now we can pull any constants out of the integral. So we can pull this a out of the integration, which gives us this next line. And then we can observe that the integral that we actually have here on this line, this fits the form of the sifting property. What we have is a shifted delta function multiplying another function, this e to the minus j omega t, and then we're integrating from minus infinity to plus infinity. So this matches the form of the sifting property. So the result of this integration is simply going to be the thing that's multiplying the shifted delta function, which is the e to the minus j omega t, evaluated for the value of t where this delta function that's been shifted is non-zero, which will be t equal to t naught. So this is going to just evaluate to e to the minus j omega t evaluate at t equal to t naught. In other words, it's going to be given by this particular expression here. And of course the constant a gets carried along. So in other words, what we have is the Fourier transform of little x, which is denoted by big X, is given by this particular formula here. And we could equivalently write that in terms of this double arrow notation. The thing on the left hand side of the double arrow is the original function. The thing on the right side of the double arrow is the Fourier transform. And then lastly in this example we're asked to write the Fourier transform representation of x. So little x is given by this particular equation in terms of big X, in other words the Fourier transform of x, and the Fourier transform of x is given by this particular formula here. Essentially this is what we just found. The next example that I'd like to consider is example 6.3. In this example, we're asked to find the Fourier transform of the function little x, where little x is given by this particular formula here. In other words, little x is the rectangular function. 
So just in case you may have forgotten, the rectangular function is defined in the manner shown in this particular annotation. In other words, the rectangular function is either equal to 1 or it's equal to 0, depending on the particular point at which you're evaluating the function. So to approach this problem, first we need to recall the definition of the Fourier transform. So this definition is given in this annotation that's been added here. So what we want to do is substitute for little x the particular function that we're given that we want to find the Fourier transform of. So if we do this, we get this line here. And now we can observe that the rectangular function, in other words, rect of t, is equal to 0 everywhere outside of the range minus 1 half to plus 1 half. Therefore, we can change these in limits of integration from minus and plus infinity to minus and plus 1 half, and this won't change anything. Then we can observe next that rect of t is always equal to 1 between minus 1 half and plus 1 half. So we can replace rect of t by 1, which gives us this next line here. Then we can integrate the exponential function that we have here. This gives us the next line. And we can evaluate the two terms associated with this line to get the next line. And next what we can observe is that the quantity in parentheses here, this pair of complex sinusoidal terms, can be rewritten as a sine function using this particular relationship here, which is basically Euler's relationship. So if we do this, we replace these complex sinusoidal terms here with a sine function on the next line. So this gives us this next line here. Then we can perform some basic algebraic manipulation, cancel the j's for example, this gives us this next line. And then what we can do next is we can express this particular uh, formula here in terms of the sinc function. If we rewrite this particular formula here, as is shown on the next line, this is just the definition of sinc of omega over 2. So we can rewrite this line here as sinc omega over 2. In other words, the Fourier transform of the function little x that we're looking for, which is denoted by big X, is equal to sinc omega over 2. Equivalently, we can express our answer in terms of double arrow notation, in other words, this notation here, which is simply saying that the Fourier transform of rect of t is given by sinc omega over 2. And just as one last comment, it's worth noting that this particular Fourier transform result is the reason why the sinc function is of such fundamental importance in engineering. Since rectangular pulses arise in many different contexts in engineering, and the Fourier transform of a rectangular pulse involves the sinc function, the sinc function is very frequently encountered when using the Fourier transform.